Josh Frydenberg, thanks very much for your company. Nice to be with you, Peter. The Financial Review seemed pretty confident from some of their reporting that you might have the states on board. There is an article from The Australian suggesting that Victoria could be the holdout state. How confident are you going into the COAG meetings tomorrow? Well, tomorrow is a really important opportunity that can't be missed for the states, the territories and the Commonwealth to be on the same page and to see through the National Energy Guarantee to its final design in August. I think the states and the territories uh, recognise that this is a unique opportunity. We have a recommendation from the Independent Energy Security Board around the National Energy Guarantee. It has received broad support from industry groups, business groups and community groups and it's been backed up by independent modelling that shows households will see prices fall. So it's a pretty compelling case and I think tomorrow uh, we will see uh, states, territories and the Commonwealth come together to move to the final design stage. There's no doubt that it does have broad support looking at all the different special interest groups and obviously in principle support has been provided as well by the federal Labor opposition. Victorian state Labor are worried that you can't upscale it if you like, and I think they're talking mostly there about emissions reductions. Your view on that? Well, the Victorian government, uh, like some of the other states, have their own state-based renewable targets. Now, it's certainly my preference that we'd only have a national scheme without state-based schemes because I think it leads to an inefficient allocation of resources. But at the same time, I can't stop the state schemes. So what the National Energy Guarantee does is it coexists with those state-based schemes. They are part of the overall target of 26 per cent reduction in emissions in the electricity sector by 2030. And I think this is a sensible outcome and it's one that allows the states to pursue their own uh, renewable energy strategies but also doesn't compromise energy affordability and energy reliability. We'll go through some of the details in a moment. I mean, obviously, reliability, emissions reductions and certainly lower prices seem to be the three core aims. But mm. what's so good about the National Energy Guarantee given that there were so many other designs that preceded it. Why did it take so long to get to it? I mean, we had the Emissions Intensity Scheme, obviously the Clean Energy Target that the Finkel Review recommended, and the continuation, otherwise, of the Renewable Energy Target itself. What's so good about this outcome? Well, for the first time, it properly integrates energy and climate policy into the one mechanism. That's been hailed by everyone from Bloomberg Energy Finance to the Grattan Institute here in Australia. Uh, and for the first time it puts a premium on reliability because as more intermittent sources of power, namely wind and solar, comes into the system, the system has struggled to cope uh, with that question of reliability. Well, so let, let's this stop on reliability then and, and, and talk about that because coal is included uh, mm. as a potentially reliable source. But some commentators take issue with that. They point out that it takes a long time to ramp up coal and therefore it's not necessarily a strong source of dispatchable power? Well, if you hasten the closure of coal, the lights will go out on the east coast of Australia. It's absolutely critical to our energy security and reliability to have coal-fired power stations. Uh, it, it is dispatchable because it is there available uh, on demand and unlike... But do you accept solar. it has long ramp-up times? But the issue here is to run coal continuously. That's the experience in our system. Uh, gas uh, can be quicker to get running than coal, but the point about coal is that it provides that continuous 24-7 synchronous generation in the system which is so critical. And what we've seen both in Victoria and South Australia, Peter, uh, with the closure of the Northern and Hazelwood power stations was a massive increase in the volatility uh, and the pricing. And uh, the wholesale electricity price, which makes up one third of your bill, increased by more than 80% in a year within those two states following the closure of those coal-fired power stations. So we have to be very careful about how we proceed to a lower emission future. Most people won't disagree with you that the design uh, of this system, if you can get it through tomorrow, does support the potential continuation of existing coal-fired power stations. We could debate what impact that may or may not have on the emissions target side mm. of the deal, but put that to one side for a moment. Is there any incentive in this guarantee scheme, this national energy guarantee, for new coal-fired power stations, or is that a bridge too far because of the start-up costs? Well, one of the aspects of this scheme is that it is technology neutral. So it doesn't discriminate as to where you get 
lower emissions from. It could be done, be done by achieving a efficiencies in a coal-fired power station or it could be through a gas-fired power station or indeed through more renewables. Uh, so there will be an incentive there to become more efficient if you're an existing coal-fired power station and because there's going to be a, a, an emphasis on reliability and that can be provided by thermal generators such as coal, they will continue to be required in the system and that's why I have said uh, most recently at the press club uh, that our 20 existing coal-fired power stations only have an, average, have, a, have an average life today of around 27 years. So they have some life left in them and therefore there may be an incentive to upgrade existing coal-fired power stations as opposed to building new ones. But you'd be blown away, wouldn't you, if there was any incentive <laughs> for new coal-fired power out of this? The, the time it takes to build, the cost, etc., it seems prohibitive, surely. Well, to build a new coal-fired power station would take at least five years, so it's not going to uh, lead to a dramatic reduction in prices in the short term. Mm. What, well, what about prices? Let's talk about that, because that's obviously one of the key aims of this. But if the investment decisions are being determined by the regulator rather than the market, you're a market liberal, is that really going to help ensure lower prices? Because the real aim uh, is not one of the long-term cost effectiveness, rather it's uh, the short-term aim of the energy mix itself. Well, actually, the prices are not being set by the regulator, they're being set in the market. And the reason why prices will come down as a result of the National Energy Guarantee is it will provide the policy certainty that these investors, these energy companies need to make their long-term bets. When you're building a generator, be it a thermal generator or a renewable generator, you're thinking 30 to 40 years hence. So you're thinking beyond the immediate political cycle or indeed the next political cycle. That's why you need a stability uh, in that environment. And that's where the National Energy Guarantee can be a long-term solution for Australia. Up to now, we've had a political battlefield uh, when it comes to climate and energy policy, and that uncertainty has played through to investors who have been reluctant to invest their billions of dollars worth of capital, which is needed uh, to, to deal with the generation that we will uh, require over the next few years, simply because they haven't had the certainty around investment. What's your reaction to the comments today by the New South Wales Deputy Premier National Party leader, John Barillaro. He says that forcibly acquiring the Liddell coal-fired coal power station uh, may well be the way to go. It was described by the Labor Shadow Energy <laughs> Minister as bringing Bolshevism to New South Wales. <laughs> well, I've said the, the forcible acquisition uh, of, uh, of Liddell would be the dead hand of socialism, Peter, because uh, what we as Liberals believe in is letting the market work and you need the right investment signals to do that. Now, Alinta, which is the fifth largest integrated energy company in Australia, is serious about acquiring Liddell from AGL. They've said they'll put in an indicative offer by the end of the month. We hope that AGL will sit down uh, to properly consider uh, this, uh, this proposal from Alinta and indeed sell it to Alinta so that it can continue beyond 2022 because we have the advice from the energy market operator that there will be a problem with the stability of supply were Liddell to close in 2022 and we also have the words of the ACCC which said that if Liddell was sold to another party it would increase competition and decrease price and that is a good outcome for consumers. You say as a, as a Liberal you support you know, the market, if you like, and the lack of intervention. Not all Liberals do, you know that. The now infamous Monash Forum, uh, they're, they're, they're inclined towards a little bit of intervention. Well, uh, certainly uh, some of them have, have talked about, uh, you know, acquiring Liddell. And like I said, I reject, re reject that view. I'd rather to see it sold by AGL to a third party. And that's what we've made uh, clear very uh, you know, constantly in our public comments, both the Prime Minister and I. What about how interventionist... AEMO can be under the National Energy mm -hmm. Guarantees. Does that concern you as a market Liberal? No, because ultimately AEMO will only come into the market as a procurer of last resort. Uh, so they will be signalling 10 years out uh, that there needs uh, to be more investment in dispatchable power and dispatchable power is power that is available on demand regardless of whether it's windy or it's sunny uh, and therefore um, the market will respond. Now if the market doesn't respond and retailers don't respond then AEMO will come in and ensure that we have sufficient supply. It's too important to the customers 
uh, interests and to the national security uh, of our electricity system uh, to, to leave it to chance. We need to have AEMA there as a means of last resort. Minister, the big final question, and I don't want you to do the equivalent of showing your hand in poker <laughs> ahead of tomorrow, but the big final question is, is there any room to move on upping the targets from the Paris Agreement? Now, we know that a number of the state governments want that figure to be higher. You've got pressure, we all know that, mm. from your right flank internally of the party to scrap it altogether, much less to up it. Do you have any room to move in a negotiation on that front? The 26% emissions reduction uh, target for the economy and indeed on a pro rata basis for the electricity sector is the right one. We have a very good record when it comes to emissions reduction, Peter. Uh, we've got the lowest level of emissions on a per capita and GDP basis in 28 years. We beat our first Kyoto target. We're on track to beat our uh, 2020 target and I'm confident mm. that we'll beat our 2030 target. So I think we've got the right uh, policies in place and the National Energy Guarantee will help us uh, meet our Paris commitment while delivering a more affordable and reliable energy system. And just a very quick procedural question, does it require all states to sign up or can you go ahead if there is one recalcitrant state? No, we require the national electricity market, states and territories, uh, to come on board because what we'll be doing is changing the national electricity rules and that requires their agreement. There will also be federal legislation, of course, as well as state legislation. Josh Frydenberg, we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Good to be with you.